Anthony, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Um, I just want to thank those those opening remarks. Oh, Jason, hey, <laughs> got on here. Um, I really appreciate the the introductions and what people said um, at the beginning. I mean, that event in 2020. I mean, geez, I mean, from I remember from that time. I think that was probably the last time that, well, one of the last times that I was out publicly. I think the last time was. Um, I was testifying on the Hill with some uh, with some policymakers who ended up testing positive for COVID um, immediately after that. And um, I mean, look, I, I could just say a few things as we start because I mean, we are in such a an interesting period of time on the health front. Um, as I was listening to those comments, what I was thinking about is how my wife is a nurse practitioner, and right now she's at work. And when she goes to work and she's seeing patients and they're testing people and they're trying to roll out the vaccine and she wears two masks, uh, glasses, a face covering, a face shield, um, her normal uh, kind of medical outfit, as well as um, a surgery gown along with two pair of gloves. Um, and every day I watch her come home from work after working 12 to 14 hours and she has to strip down and take everything off in kind of our mud room area by the garage and instantly take a shower and then get tested on a regular basis to ensure that she's not further exposing me or our kids. And, you know, for the first, I would say four months of the pandemic, she actually slept in a different part of the house. And so, I mean, when we look at the number of people who have been impacted by this, including my family and friends and people who I know who, who have passed away. I mean, it's definitely, definitely serious. And even when the media isn't focusing on exactly what's going on because the, the media fluctuates based on what they think is the hottest topic. Um, I mean, there are so many people dying. And so hopefully we can get that vaccine uh, properly rolled out. Um, you heard that I got my PhD in Indiana. So I take pride in, uh, in being a Hoosier in that way. I mentioned earlier that I'm originally from Tennessee. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I uh, grew up in Atlanta, actually. Spent my elementary school years there. I went to undergrad at the University of Memphis, then went to grad school in Indiana while I was there. Did a series of things. I taught some statistical courses at the University of Michigan, spent a couple of summers there. I also spent um, over six months in Germany at the University of Mannheim, where I was teaching a course to students from five different countries, actually teaching a course on race and ethnic relations in a globalized context, looking at the way that ethnic conflict uh, creates division across different uh, nations. Came back, finished up in Indiana, went to UC Berkeley. I was telling that story there. I, I, I'll never forget when I was like, wow, I'm in, really in a different place. Is, um, I saw a man walking a raccoon on a leash and I just knew that I was just in a in a very different place. And I just had my oldest son. And for those of you that have kids, you know, you're just like on alert when you have like a baby that you're controlling. I was like, what world am I living in? But we were there. Both of our boys happened to be born in California. So they're Californians. They talk about how they were born in Oakland. I'm like, man, boy, y'all are from Maryland. Like, don't, you know, you were born there, but we moved to the DC area uh, when they were babies. Uh, my oldest was almost two years old. And we've been in the DC area ever since then. Um, as you heard Kathy say, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. And then I'm also a fellow and policy analyst at the Brookings Institution, which is a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, DC. So let me get started without further ado. What I hope that will happen is that, that look, that you'll have a lot of questions. Um, I really hope that you take Kathy up as we go through this, as you're thinking about stuff. Put those questions in there. This is a difficult conversation. Um, I do this a lot. This is this is what I do for a living. I take it um, pretty strongly in terms of how we think about it. Um, and part of that, I don't know how that extra uh, I got in that word, but um, part of thinking about this is have your questions answered today. I'm going to present formally for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we're, we're going to have a lot of time for Q&A. I look forward to your questions. And what I want to start off with, and I think sometimes this question at this point in time is <clears throat> maybe a bit off base, but I think it's important because I never make assumptions on where people are and where we start. 
is when we talk about race relations, is the glass half empty or half full in how we think about it? Well, I think it depends. Historically, I mean, we've made tons of progress. I mean, we have to look at, for example, the incoming, um, the incoming administration, presidential administration. It's the most diverse that we've had in American history as it relates to race, as it relates to gender. And it's continuously increased for, for the most part over time. And that's part of what America is. That's part of thinking about American exceptionalism. At the same time though, there are people who don't necessarily think that that's the case. So when you, when you look at it, you ask people, if we're just talking about blacks and whites, is race relations good or bad? Over 50% of whites say it's bad. Over 70% of blacks say it's bad. When asked, has the, the current president made things worse? About 50% of whites say, yeah, Trump has made race relations worse. You see about 70% of blacks say the same thing. And then does the legacy of slavery affect the position of black people today? Despite what people might say, like nearly 60% of white people say, yeah. Now people are still trying to make sense of that. And of course, black people experience it. So it's a higher percentage of them who acutely understand it. But it's very clear that a majority of Americans are saying that something is wrong. The way I like to think about it is maybe it's not exactly a question of whether or not it's empty or full, but maybe the glass changes shape over time. And the research that I've done over the years, some of which I'll share, I mean, I do work on a, on a host of things. Uh, most of my work now focuses on policing and health disparities. So you can imagine that 2020 literally collided on what I do. I also do work on voter turnout. So, I mean, 2020 was one of those years where uh, work-wise, I felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose, but it was important to try to do this work. This is what the Capitol looked like on Wednesday. I mean, this is what it looked like. And, and when I look at this picture, you're probably saying, well, what is that? Is that fire? No, I kind of think it's like light with tear gas and some other stuff. But when you see the number of people who are there in that area, and I can tell you because I, I go to Capitol Hill often, as I mentioned earlier, testifying, meeting with policymakers, you can't even get there on a normal day. And, I, and I've even been up there during COVID times. You can't even get close to the areas where they are. So part of it, we have to ask ourselves how that happened. And, I, and I, obviously there'll be an investigation, but I think it's, it's kind of clear and you, know, you can ask me what I think as we go along. But the point of showing these images is to just highlight that about four years ago, this is where we were. And when we juxtapose these images, we can see some interesting things. And part of this is thinking about a simple stat that's extremely important that in places where Donald Trump held a campaign rally at in 2016, hate crimes increased over 200%. It's just an empirical fact, over 200% from where they were. And part of this is we could go slightly farther back and look at what happened at Mother AME Emanuel Church in South Carolina where Dylan Roof, um, a reported uh, white supremacist after being welcomed into this church and having Bible study with these people, he shot and killed nine people, including people from very young ages to very old ages. And it even doesn't stop there, at least for me. You can see a little picture there um, at this bus stop. This is at the University of Maryland. The person on that picture is First Lieutenant Richard W. Collins III, who was graduating from Bowie State University, was going to be a paratrooper in Asia. This is him. And he was murdered, stabbed to death at the University of Maryland by um, Sean Urbanski, who is, uh, well, was a University of Maryland student and was recently convicted of murder. And this is what graduation looked like because he was said to graduate two days later. Lieutenant Collins, I think, represented what we want America to be. He happened to be standing there at the time with two of his friends who were also about to graduate, happened to be a white man and an Asian woman. Like that is for a lot of people, the type of diversity we wanna see. Sean Urbanski comes up, he disrupts this. He tells the white man and the Asian woman to move if you know what's good for you. And then he directly approached Lieutenant Collins and stabbed him to death. Took one of the great people that we have in this world. And 
this hits me hard because I pass this bus stop basically every day when I go to campus. And these are the type of outcomes that we talk about, is that these are the pinnacles, but there are other things that are trickle down effects that happen in our country that really earlier this week kind of hit his head. And this is the thing, when we look at hate crimes in the US, there are a lot of them. These are just the reported ones. These aren't even the things that, that we don't necessarily see. But when you look at this, what you see is the way that hate crimes have been increasing over time. We did start to have a, a slight dip, and then all of a sudden we started to see an increase. Now, what I wanna do after I've laid out that initial part of you know, how bad things are, I wanna talk about where we are in different phases of life. I wanna walk you through various parts of the life course of, in many regards, what does it mean to be black in America? How do we think about it? And I'll also bring in other groups making comparisons as well, but focusing on this group given what's um, happened over the past year. Let's start off with housing and education two things that we think are foundational. This is Washington, D.C., okay? What you're seeing on this map is um, Washington, D.C. It's, it's a diamond. And what I want you to look at is that this map represents income. This map represents race. You can basically put them on top of one another. The lighter color on the left represents people who are higher income. This is actually where Brookings is. This is like where I work at in Northwest. It's like right here, like right up in this area. Very affluent area. Um, on the other hand, this is a very poor area. And then if we look at this map, this poor area is also where Blacks are more likely to live. And the lighter colors are where Whites are more likely to live. What's interesting about this is that we could take a map from 100 years ago in Washington, D.C. and basically see the same thing. The darker colors are where more blacks live. The lighter colors are more where, where more whites live. This was from decades ago. And we could take this map and do it with basically almost any major city in the United States. Now, this is partly because of redlining and segregation and restrictive covenants terms that I can unpack, but you all probably know this. And part of thinking through this is that this segregation created oftentimes um, some black uh, forms of wealth that people don't oftentimes know about. I think people are starting to know a little bit about it. One of the most infamous ones is what, what was called Black Wall Street in Tulsa, in Greenwood, Oklahoma. This area that you're looking at is, uh, is predominantly black and affluent, had hundreds of businesses, was thriving, and then this is what happened in Tulsa when the KKK merged with law enforcement to literally drop bombs, murder, and destroy the people who live in those areas. 300 people were killed, 35 blocks destroyed. Not only was it lives destroyed, but it was also property and wealth destroyed. There are other examples too. In East St. Louis, up to 200 people were killed, 300 businesses destroyed. And I want you to focus on this because it's, it's not only about the bodies and that's what it should be about, but it's also about the number of businesses destroyed. That one of the narratives that we continuously hear in America is that, oh, if you work hard and you do what you're supposed to do, that you can be successful. And in some cases, that's definitely the case. But certain people and certain groups have more barriers than others. And wealth is oftentimes centralized and concentrated. And if wealth is continuously stripped from one group of people or one area, it makes it more difficult to do that. Let's go to Florida, Rosewood. This was another very affluent black town, up to 150 deaths in 1923. Detroit, 1943, 34 killed, including 16 by police. $28 million in damages. This was the sign that was put as Black people started to integrate Detroit. And I want y'all to think about what we know about Detroit today, right? People know about the auto manufacturers and how they went away and now how it's a Black city and people don't really look at it in the same way, but we missed this part that led up to that, that there's a legacy here that people live through. 
These are tons of other examples. Might be difficult for you to see on your screen. But well into the 1960s, Rochester, New York, Watts, California, Chicago, Cleveland, Newark. We can go back even farther to what happened pretty much as, um, as slavery was ending, that the Homestead Act was passed. The Homestead Act opened up 46 million acres of public land for sale. And when I say for sale, really what it meant was you go to a place that hadn't been claimed and you say you want that. Now, let me tell you about this. The primary beneficiaries for the first six months were freed men, were black people who were former slaves, who were in desperate need of land. But before too much land was distributed, the law was, was repealed in June 1876, so just 10 years later. And this land ended up being given to, uh, to white families over black families. Black families were excluded. The Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the railroads that we know that go from the East to the West Coast came about from the Homestead Act. Some of the wealthiest families that exist in the United States, their wealth came from the Homestead Act. That amount increased from 46 million to 270 million acres. Of course, we could also talk about how this was coinciding with the removal of Native Americans from their land. So a lot of what we see going out West and throughout uh, the country, these wild, wild West movies that if you were like me, I used to watch them with my granddaddy and loved them, that a lot of this was about the Homestead Act at the bottom line and how Black people were excluded from that and the Native Americans were excluded from that. And that land, if you're like most people, over 50% of people's wealth is wrapped up in their property. It doesn't mean they don't have investments, doesn't mean they don't do the stock market, doesn't mean they don't have 401k and other things that they diversify in in their businesses. But a majority of wealth stems from home ownership and property in that home ownership. And that home ownership is directly linked, that property is directly linked to school funding. What you're seeing is how over time, school funding has become more about local property taxes and less about state or federal aid. This means if you live in a more affluent area, your school is gonna be better. Of course, that's the reason why you probably chose to live where you live. Part of the reason why we chose to live where we live because the schools are better, the resources are better. But in America, supposedly we are told, American exceptionalism, right, is that every child should be given an equal education. And that could be farther from the truth. You all know it like I know it. And part of this has a direct impact as it relates to social class. I want you all to look at what it means to be proficient. Proficient in education is an interesting term because proficient is really just average. It's not even, it's not even something that's amazing, but proficient is really average. And then you have advanced, which is where I think a lot of us want people to be low poverty. These are people who we would consider to be middle class or upper class. Look at eighth grade when we look at this, who's considered proficient and then who's considered proficient in people who live in low income areas. Because see, this is, this is the trickle down effect. Because of the way segregation is operated, it's not just about race, it's also about class. And it also trickles to working class whites and rural whites. I know that from being from Tennessee and living in Indiana and the like. So it's not like we could just separate it, right? There is a combination effect where it's about race and it's also about class. Yes, blacks are here harder, but there are a lot of white families who are struggling similarly in certain areas. And a lot of it comes from the way property has been done in predominantly black areas that have then transitioned over time and been depleted of the resources that they need. Another thing that people talk about is behavior in schools. People say, well, look, the reason why people aren't successful, the reason why people don't do good in school is they're just bad. And when you look at this graph, it suggests that's the case. Let me tell you what you're looking at. The gray bar, so this is whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, American Indian, uh, Native Hawaiian, and then people who are considered multiracial. The gray lines is the percentage of people in the preschool population. We're talking about preschoolers, okay? We're talking about pretty much two to five-year-olds. Let me be clear what we're talking about. The orange lines 
is the percentage of preschoolers who are suspended. Now, I don't know about you, but when my kids were two to five year old, they did just a whole bunch of two to five year old stuff. They jump, they play, they cry, they whine, they fall out. I don't know what they'd be doing to get suspended from preschool. Like, I, I really don't know. And I especially don't know what they do to get suspended from preschool when I'm paying for it. Like, that, that's also just something that blows my mind, too. But think about two to five-year-olds. We're not talking about elementary school, middle school, high schoolers. We're talking preschoolers. And when you look at this, you say, wow, one orange line is different from the other. 42% of all preschool suspensions are among Black kids. They, only, they represent less than 20% of the preschool population. Now, you see that stat, and a lot of people are like, man, these kids are just bad. I mean, and that badness comes from somewhere, their family, their bodies or something. One thing I love about research is that it goes a lot deeper. And there was a, coupled with this study, was that they sent in, they gave, and, and I use these in the work, work that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, they put on glasses like I have, and they put eye trackers on them. And they sent them into schools, all right, so that they could track the eyes of teachers. And then they also put in observers to observe these classrooms. What did they find? They find that whenever something happens in a classroom, teachers do two things. First, they look at boys. Has to be the boys, right? The boys are always acting up. Can't be the girls. Even though at this age, they're doing very similar things. And not only do they look at boys, they're more likely to look at black boys. This starts what we call the school to prison pipeline. The other thing they find with the suspensions, that if you're poor and black or either, that um, they're more likely to call police when something happens in schools. If you're more affluent or white and both, they're more likely to call your parents. So these disparities we see, the observer said, look, these kids were doing the same thing. But instead, what it was about is who the teachers looked at who they chose to get in trouble, and then who they chose to call to deal with it. These are the fundamental differences that happens. And it impacts college enrollment. You see that Asians are over every other group followed by whites and then blacks and Latinos. Now look, this has increased over time. I mean, if we just go back to the 1980s, this is a positive trend, right? Not as high as people want. Well, people always say, well, why are Asians so high? Well, there are a series of stereotypes that people throw out. Let me tell you what it is. It's a couple of things. First, um, Asians are more likely to be immigrants. And among all groups, immigrants are more likely to have higher levels of education. Why is that? That's because the United States immigration policies, no matter if you're from, from Europe, Asia, or Africa, or South America, that they are more likely to allow People who have, say, certain skills, this is literally in the language of our immigration policy, certain skills that will benefit America. So in Asia, whether that be if you're from India or from Korea or Japan or China, you might be more likely to be able to come to the United States for education with the expectation that you're going to be here to produce something that can benefit the people in the United States. And that is the primary pattern. How do we know that? Because when we disentangle Asians who are immigrants, from Asian Americans who were born in the United States, second, third generation, their education levels significantly drop off. That is not about them being Asian per se. It's about the immigration effect. The same way among Blacks, if you compare African immigrants to African Americans born in the United States, you see huge differentials in their education outcomes. Once people get to college, what do we see? Well, we see huge differentials. And when we look at six years out, who ends up graduating, which is kind of, kind of the, 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 the blue who ends up graduating and who doesn't. Now, again, you're probably looking at this and saying, well, what are Blacks and Latinos doing? Like, why are they so much less likely to finish? Well, if you were like me and you went to college, college is expensive. And if you're one of these uh, parents who are preparing to send your child to college or are sending them to college now, whew, I tell you, I mean, colleges are expensive. At the University of Maryland, University of Maryland, this is a public school. University of Maryland has the lowest tuition in the Big Ten. If you send your child to University of Maryland, and they're, of course, required to stay on campus as a freshman, I'll tell you why in a second this will make sense, required to stay on campus as a freshman, 
you will pay about $48,000 for their tuition, their housing, their food, and all the other stuff they need. $48,000. So what does that mean? Well, if you come from an area that doesn't have as much money, oh, oh, and let me backtrack because I just said that the tuition was the lowest. Well, a way to compensate for that, universities then require freshmen to live on campus and they jack up the housing prices. So now you're on the hook for all that money, right? Which is something that I think is blasphemous that hopefully will be changed soon. Of course, it's starting to be a lot of momentum for dealing with public education and the way it's become uh, corporate and higher education. But part of what that impacts, and I'll bring it back later, but the punchline is that that then impacts how much student loans people take out. And I'll come back to that when I get to wealth. But supposedly after college, you get a good job, right? You go work for a corporation, a company like where you all are. And what happens when you get there? Well, it depends. Based on your degree and based on your race impacts the likelihood of what type of job you might get. This was a study published in one of the top sociology journal called Social Forces, run out of the uh, University of North Carolina. And what this study looked at, it's an experiment, an audit study, sent applications to employers and said, uh, pick who you will hire. They essentially had four categories. All the stuff on the resumes was the same except for two things, the school they went to and what their race was. And what they found was, um, if you went to an Ivy League school and you were white, you had a much higher chance of getting a job. And then if you were black and went to these Ivy League schools, it dropped off quite a bit. And then interestingly, that if you were white and went to a state school, nothing wrong with it, I went to a state school, love Memphis, but you went to a state school, North Carolina State or something like that, that you almost had a similar percentage of being hired for a job is blacks who went to an Ivy League school. And if you're black and you went to a state school, I mean, well, hey, the, these are the, the, the disparities. There was nothing different in the applications except for the school and the name. And when you really look at it, it is the race that's playing a bigger difference than necessarily the school. Now the school makes a difference. People, people can justify that. People are like, oh, well, if you went to Harvard, supposedly that means something, right? But if you're just black or white, that shouldn't mean something outside of the fact that you went to a Harvard compared to University of Memphis or University of Maryland. Spills over even farther. Diva Pager, Dr. Diva Pager, professor at uh, Princeton and Harvard. She passed away a few years ago to a rare health condition, but she left us with some very important research that continues to drive policy. What she wanted to know is as incarceration has continued to increase in the United States, and even though it's now kind of stable and dipping, but for most of us, as I look at those of us on the, um, on the Zoom, that uh, the age that we are, we know we grew up in an era of mass incarceration, late 80s, 90s, 2000s. And part of thinking about that is people are going to be getting out of prison, right? There are over 2 million people that are incarcerated. They're going to be getting out of prison. What are their job prospects? What did she do? What she did was she sent applications out. And then she sent people to go try to get those jobs. She matched them up. They, they were the similar physically, their haircut was short. There were only two differences, whether or not they had a criminal record or not. So whether or not when you look on their resume, they had a criminal record or not, and whether or not they were white or black. What she found truly shocked her. Not only did whites without a criminal record, were they more likely to get called back and hired than blacks, but whites with a criminal record were more likely to get called back and hired than Blacks without a criminal record. This study has continuously been replicated over the past 15 years or so, and the results continue to show the same thing. This is race in America, that a factor that most of us do not want to matter actually does in ways that unnerve us all. And it impacts a host of things, like how much money you end up making, all right? Now, again, I love these graphs because when you look at it on the surface, these are what we call descriptive statistics. They just give you a number. They don't give you any context. So you're looking at this and you're like, hold up. Okay. Yeah. Whites make more than others, but Asians make way more than everybody else. Well, let me tell you why. If we were in person, I would ask you all this question. You'd be able to give me quick feedback. It's very simple. Asians live in the three most expensive states in the United States, New York, California, and Hawaii. Once you take that into account, their income actually drops 
to where we see all races at in purple. So this is what I love about statistics, right? You see these numbers and people like, well, Asians can't ever say they're discriminated against. Well, look, this is not exactly how this works, right? If you don't take into account where people live, and look, I can tell you, I've lived in two of the most expensive places in the United States, and they are expensive, D.C. and California. And I mean, it, it's, it's just not, it's just indescribable <laughs> how expensive these places are. So it doesn't matter if you make it $80,000 in California or D.C. It doesn't feel like it. I remember living in Bloomington as a grad student. I was making like Twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. I was living like a champ. I had a house. I could go out to eat every chance I wanted. I could do all kind of stuff. I go to Colts games and IU games. I moved to California and I can't even get a get a get a Warriors ticket. And that was before Steph Curry. They weren't even good then. I couldn't even afford to go there. So we can talk about these differences, and but we have to break down these particular things. And then there's a spillover, right? Because based on who gets in the in the pipeline professionally, then impacts who ends up getting to the top. This is the number of CEOs of 500 companies, the Asians, Blacks, and Latinos. And what we see, this is this the raw number on the left, it's not a percentage. That yeah, the, the percentage has increased to a certain extent, except, except for Blacks, like it stayed really consistent. For Latinos, it's increased some. For um, Asians, it's increased some. But for Blacks, it's continued to stay the same. And part of that has to do with some of the things that I mentioned earlier around education and incarceration. So. There are basically no black CEOs in Fortune 500 companies. Now that slightly changed, this was five years ago, but it's, it's still only about 1%, only about 1%. This impacts who gets put on boards, who starts to make decisions about boards. I'm on a series of, of, of company boards and organization boards. And I mean, kind of the lack of diversity on them is, is stark, um, even starker than some of the, the, the higher ed spaces that I tend to be in. And we know that these boards make a lot of decisions about how to utilize money, how to make decisions and how to do that sort of thing. So, I mean, when we put all other groups together, I mean, they are so low that these are the kind of things that companies can actually do something about. Minority appointments, I mean, hasn't really changed much over the past decade. So, I mean, even with the, 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 the slight increase for Blacks, it still doesn't do um, a big thing in terms of making an impact on what's going on on companies. Collectively, all of this messes with wealth. This was in 2012. The wealth gap has basically stayed exactly the same. Hasn't hardly changed at all. That this is the wealth gap. Does this mean that the people who have more wealth work harder? No, not necessarily. It definitely means they're probably working hard. But the people who don't have wealth are probably also working hard. And one of our assumptions is that if you don't have something, you haven't worked hard for it. And unfortunately, there are systemic barriers in place that even before someone does something racist or sexist, like those things matter too, but the system in place plays a role in where people are and what they end up having. And then if we go over time, we see that it hasn't done a lot, right? Even during the recession, when we saw that, is that still to this day, the average white family has about 10 times more wealth than the average black family. That that continues to be the case today. Now, part of this, as I talked about where you live, where you go to school, and then the type of job you get leads to blacks taking out more money in student debt. They just have a much higher percentage that they have to take out for student loans. So even if they get into a great school, and I can use myself as an example, what are the reasons I ended up in Memphis? was I played sports in high school. I played baseball and football and I, I love sports. And, you know, and I was also a, a smart kid. So I was in AP courses and all that kind of stuff. And grad, I mean, my, my school was competitive, a large, large high school. I graduated with 2,400 people. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a series of choices and I got in, I got hurt playing sports, tore my knee up. So I was like, all right, how's, how's this kind of going to kind of work? And you know, I got some weird offers athletically. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to do this academic thing. So I got scholarships to Memphis, UT Knoxville. But the place I really wanted to go was Morehouse College in Atlanta, which is um, a college primarily for Black men. And um, I got in and I even got some money. But the gap between the amount of money I got and what the loans I would have had to take, it was like a $30,000 gap. I didn't think that was a smart move. So I went to Memphis. 
But some other people would have chosen to do that because they felt like the upside was there. But then the impact that's going to have on them long term is quite profound. All right. Now, part of thinking through this is making the connection that I said earlier about the history and the legacy of slavery and land. One thing that you all may or may not know, you probably heard it, 40 acres and a mule. What does that mean? Well, once slavery was ended, General Sherman made a mandate and he said, look, we need to correct what happened with slavery right now. So what he did was he instituted um, an article, a piece of legislation that said every freed family will get 40 acres and a mule. That is to atone for slavery. OK, now that made a lot of sense. Well, let me tell you what happened. After Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, that legislation was reversed. Not only was it reversed and black people didn't get what was due them to atone for slavery. That's another word we might call reparations. They gave that land back to the slave owners and then they paid them. They federal government paid slave owners for lost wages and lost property, that property being their former enslaved black people. And still to this day, in an area in Maryland, in Prince George's County, which is the most affluent black county in the United States, there is a house that sits in the middle of one of the most affluent neighborhoods. And that house is the house of the slave owners that is still there. And they have been able to make money off of that land multiple times over. Well, now the same land where Black people were in the fields, they are now being sold plots of land, a half an acre of land, a quarter acre of land from the same family that used to own people who look like them. That is the legacy of how we think about slavery. But let's go up north, because people always some kind of way think that New York or the north is kind of different. It's not if you look at this, this is an African, bur uh, African, what's called an African burial ground. It's in New York City by Wall Street. It's actually under federal buildings that houses the FBI, the CIA. Let me tell you what happened here. When these buildings were being built some decades ago, and if you know anything about building land and property, you know the land has to perk, right? They have to make sure they can build and they can do all that. And since these were government buildings, they were going deep into the ground to try to protect them from, you know, all sorts of threats that could happen. And they were like, wow, this land is like really, really fertile. This is like strange. They did an excavation and they found about 20,000 skeletons from African slaves who were brought over on slave ships to Wall Street in New York. That was one of the docking stations. So underneath these buildings is this African burial ground where black bodies were buried um, as they were coming off of that. Let's fast forward even more. Because a lot of people say, well, look, my family wasn't here then, or that doesn't apply to me. That was so long ago. Ira Katz Nelson, who you see on the top left, um, he wrote a uh, classic book called When Affirmative Action Was White. And what he talked about was that how after um, the stock market crash of 1929, after World War II, part of what Roosevelt did, you see him on the bottom left, um, I think he's, you know, one of, one of, the, the best presidents that the United States has ever had. He, he's one of the reasons why we have term limits. He served for about four terms. Um, if you haven't been to his uh, memorial in DC, you, you should definitely go. But what he's doing right there, he's signing the New Deal, which is one of the, the best legislations that ever could have came for the United States. What this New Deal did, because we have to think about this, unemployment, as bad as unemployment was in 2020, as bad as it was in, say, 2009, unemployment was double that mark in the early 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt took evasive action and he signed the New Deal. The New Deal had two main components. It had Social Security and it had the GI Bill. Both of these legislations that we still use today single-handedly catapulted what we know to be the middle class now. The middle class was created. It wasn't that people started working harder or started doing something different. It was that the government provided resources 
which is part of what the government's supposed to be, right? We pay taxes, and then when something happens, so things are supposed to be catapulted to help families get up and move on. The New Deal policies, Social Security, I think most of you know about that. It, Social Security did a few other things, though, besides give people retirement. Social Security set minimum wages. Social, Social Security set work hours. This is where we got the 40 hour work week from. They were like, we need to figure out a way how people aren't working like crazy. They can still, t st uh, still spend time with their family. And look, if you're like me, look, I mean, I'm working 60, 80 hours a week, sometimes more depending on what's going on, but I, I have flexibility on where I can do that. But for people then, they were going to factories, they were working in different places. Social Security, great policy. When Franklin Roosevelt signed this though, he made a deal. And he made a deal with some racist politicians. That deal was to exclude two occupations from Social Security funding. That was domestic work and farm work. Why is that significant? That's significant because those were still two of the only jobs that Black people could really get, even a few decades after slavery, as we were now in Jim Crow. Those two occupations represented 75% of Black people living in the South which is where a majority of Black people lived in, 60% of Black people across the country were excluded from Social Security. So my great-grandmother was not included in Social Security, right? For some of you on here, your great-grandmother was. Let's go to the GI Bill. The GI Bill, which still to this day, is still one of the largest federal government initiatives in American history and should be. People go to war and fight for our ability to engage in what uh, four-star Marine General John Allen, who's the president of Brookings always says, the democratic experiment. He says that because he's like, look, we, we still haven't actualized the true goals and meaning that was in the constitution, but we're moving there, right? And we have to keep moving in that direction. The GI Bill did that. I come from a strong military and law enforcement family. My grandfather served in two wars, Purple Heart, Bronze Star. He uh, was a drill sergeant, served over 20 years in the Army. My mother was admitted to West Point in the late 1970s as a Black woman. I mean, that's, I mean that legacy is, is pretty insane. My great uncle was the first Black chief of police of my hometown. And then from there, I had another uncle who became a police officer. His son, who was my cousin, became a police officer, and others. That's my family lineage. So like, I remember when I used to come home from grad school and I'd be sitting on my grandma's couch, which was one of the most comfortable places I've ever been in in my life. And my family would say, boy, are you still in school? Like, it was like a thing. Like, why are you still in school? Why aren't you like, you know, why, why didn't you enlist or why didn't you go to the police academy? That's my legacy. Why is that important? That's important. And, and then of course, not only my grandparents, but my, my great grandparents, so forth and so on, have served our country. In fact, one weird stat that I, I continue to be baffled by, Black people actually enroll in the military at, at a higher percentage than whites do. But for some reason, that never carries over. That some type of way there's a narrative that certain groups are anti-American, but that could be farther from the truth when you serve your country in the purest way. The GI Bill, when people came back from World War II, the GI Bill was put in place because we still had a draft. I want you to think about this, eight out of 10 men, eight out of 10 men, this means essentially 80% of families based on the way we think traditionally back then, eight out of 10 men were drafted to go to war, received GI Bill funding, or supposedly did. GI Bill did a few things. They could use grants to go to college, didn't have to pay for college. They could use grants to put down on homes. They could use grants to start up a business, or they could use a grant to send their kids to college. And early on, they could do all of those things at once. Why is that important? Well, because white soldiers and black soldiers were fighting side by side in the war, but when they came back, white soldiers were given their due and given their GI Bill money and black soldiers were not. These two policies single-handedly construct the middle class that we see today. Because a majority of people who got a home equity line of credit to go to college that their parents took out or grew up in a house when they were growing up, those things were not afforded to black families in the same way. They were excluded. They did what they were supposed to do. They went to work or, or they went to war and they were excluded from these opportunities. 
And so the middle class was created, but it excluded black people. And for some reason we have this amnesia as if government programs did not create the neighborhoods that we see today. There are other things that also just impacted in discrimination ways. Like black sounding names are 50% less likely to get jobs than white sounding names. My college roommate, his name is Markeith Jones. He's from St. Louis. He's now a corporate executive at a large banking uh, company. And he never uses the MAR in his name. When he was starting out, he was a, um, he was a, a corporate loan officer. And he said that when he put the MAR on his name and then he removed it, he would notice a drastic change in how many calls he got because people are looking at the list, deciding who to call. They would not call him until he put Keith Jones and it started to impact what was going on. When it comes to mortgage loans, blacks in the highest income bracket compared to whites in the highest in income bracket got denied for mortgage loans about three times as much. And then of course we know in public spaces, there have been a series of things that have happened over the past couple of years with video evidence that we've been able to capture forms of discrimination that have occurred and the sort of things that happen every single day. I wanna quickly talk about a couple of things in our end. We also know this transcends to health where um, the infant mortality rate for black women is significantly higher for other groups. People say, what is that? Like, again, it goes to, well, it has to be something about them and their bodies. No, Serena Williams and Beyonce have reported similar incidents. It's called benign neglect. It's called discrimination. It's a pain threshold. Serena Williams, who no one can say isn't one of the most fit people in the world, probably ever. Beyonce either. Both of them report almost dying while giving birth because they said they were in pain and people did not pay attention to them. This is a study, just quickly, I'll tell you, you have the, the, the light gray, which is white, the dark grays, which are black, that they asked people, they said, a person is in pain and they report their pain being an eight on a scale from one to 10 or something like that. How much pain medica medication would you give them? They asked different groups. They asked college students, they asked doctors, they asked police officers, they asked the general public. For every single group, people were less likely to give pain medication to blacks compared to whites. And I want y'all to think about this because recently you probably heard about this story of a black woman who went viral and then died in the hospital filming herself on Facebook Live saying that she was in pain and the doctors would not give her pain medication. She was a physician herself. These are the types of things that happen when you're black in America. We can try to act like they don't happen, but they do. So what do we do about this? Well, I've developed a racial equity framework that you all and the work you're doing at your company is laudable. I mean, it is something that everyone should be doing, all companies should be doing. I praise you all for doing it. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the process. I know this is part of a broader process and your company, your employees, your clients will be better for it. And so it's, it's great, it's difficult conversations, but it's so, so important. Part of what we just did, you all became what I call racial equity learners. You're educating yourself about the historical legacy of structural and then interpersonal racism. They're different, but they're linked. Interpersonal is what people do to one another. Structural and systemic racism are things that are happening because of historical policies that have been put in place that have never been properly corrected. So what's your next step? Well, to become a racial equity advocate and a racial equity broker. You all are already becoming racial equity brokers as a company because you're looking at your policies and your practices to allow for accountability, objective evaluation, and transparency. What does it mean to be a racial equity advocate? Well, it means holding friends, family, and coworkers accountable for what they say, think, and do about racism. Some of the work that I do at the Lab for Applied Social Science Research, where I'm the, the, the director, we developed an innovative virtual reality decision-making program. We put police officers through a series of trainings and we give them what are called implicit association tests. These are tests that gauge their implicit biases. You have implicit bias, thing, bias you may not know you have or don't want to admit versus explicit bias. And what we found, honestly, it truly shocked me how extreme it was. We gave them a test about who they associate weapons with more, blacks or whites. And we found that police officers are much more likely to associate weapons with black people than they are with white people. And part of this means this is who they view as a threat, 
right? That blackness becomes weaponized. That even when a black person doesn't have a weapon, it might be perceived that they do. What's key about this graph I'll show you? This graph is from a very diverse group of police officers. We work with police departments across the country. This isn't just white officers or just white male officers. All officers, regardless of race, fall into these categories. While Blacks are slightly less likely to hold the same biases, they still do though. And we have to get past the narrative that some kind of way it's just white people or white men doing this because it's a socialization thing. One of the best examples I can give you is a study that looked at stop and frisk. What they did was quickly, it was about 700,000 stops. This was the percentage of stops by race. Half of the stops were black, a third were Latino, 10% were white. 56% of these stops involved frisking. Only 2% of these stops led to discovery of contraband, a previous criminal record, or a person being on parole. 6% resulted in arrest, mostly for resisting arrest. But look at the number of times force was used. Over 75,000 times force was used on Blacks. Over 50,000 times force was used on Latinos. It suggests that there is something going on there that's a problem. And this is the crutch of it when it comes to policing. All the stuff that happens with policing, this is the bottom line. The top graph, the top bar, is the percentage of the US population. This is all people killed by police, okay? Black people are disproportionately more likely to be killed by police. A lot of people say, oh, well that's because black people are always doing something, right? They're just more likely to be criminals. Even statistically, if it's still a very low percentage, like in any given year, a white person or a black person have uh, only about 4% are arrested or stopped for something, um, but that still doesn't mean, and hold on, let me, let me rephrase that. Only about 4% are arrested for certain types of violent crimes. Let me be more specific. But when we see this, all people killed by police. And then when we look at people killed by police when they're not attacking, and this is also when they don't have a weapon, we would expect this dark blue to decrease. Because if police report that the person is not attacking and does not have a weapon, why did they end up being killed? We would expect this 31% to get smaller, not bigger. It suggests that it's not about what they're doing and it's about what they look like. And we have to be willing to admit that. And that's part of what's happening in America right now. This is the other thing we have to do. And I, I do think this is happening and it's gonna happen based on the things that I've done on Capitol Hill with policymakers across the aisle, Republicans and Democrats who are really wanted to do something about this issue. Only 40% of police departments report to the federal government and the FBI about their use of force. Only 40%. We know how many people get killed by jellyfish every year, but we don't know how many people are killed by the police. That should unnerve us all, particularly when we look at, even though whites are less likely than their percentage in the population to be killed by police, they are still being killed by police at very high rates. So we have to be clear about that. Some of the things we've done, we developed an innovative virtual reality decision-making program. I'll kind of skip over this, but I'll just show you. We put police officers through a virtual reality program where we can help them examine their biases and then use objective information when they're making decisions with people. We measure their heart rate. We measure their stress through speech. We measure their body movement. We can track their weapons. I mean, you name it. We do all kinds of innovative things. We can track their eyes. So how do you become a racial equity advocate? Well, you become racially competent. You create a respectful environment. You hold people for their treatment of others and you build bridges across racial divides. And mostly you do this when you're sitting at tables with people who you love and like. Because most of the tables that we sit at, those people at those tables look just like us. And if I'm sitting at a table or I'm with say my male friends and one of them says something sexist and I never speak up or speak out because women aren't there. Then as my grandfather taught me, he learned this in the military, our silence is our acceptance. You can't be silent when someone says something because kids are watching, other people are observing, and then they think you're consenting to it. So when someone says something that's racist or bigoted, you can say, yeah, I don't really agree with that. I don't really think that's right. Or, you know, I, I must, I actually don't, I actually think, you know, research shows something different there. Or if you're like me and you're watching a game in a normal non-COVID year with family, somebody says something, I'm like, look, I, look, Uncle Junior, I don't, I don't even agree with you on that. I'm not even going to get into you with, about that. We can talk about this later. I just want to go on record 
to everybody here that I don't think that's true and I don't agree with it. When I'm not going to argue with you, I'm trying to watch the game. I'm trying to see the Cowboys lose again, but I'm just trying to sit up here and watch the game and we're not going to talk about that. Part of that is means to create brave spaces. We have to be brave at work, at home. Be brave. Stand up for the world that you want your kids to grow up in. And then when it comes to being a broker, you have to have a clearly defined mission. You have to have clearly defined competencies and outcomes. And you have to be strategic and proactive in how you do it. And you have to assess impact. Employee attrition, workforce satisfaction, climate. You don't do this when something is happening. You just do it just as part of your everyday evaluation. Because you want to know why people are coming and leaving. You want to know what's happening. You want to know how you can retain people, how you can create a world-class occupation. So I want to ask you, how do you plan to be a racial equity advocate? What are you going to do? Some of the things that's been done, David Rubenstein, who most people know the name, I happen to hold one of the fellowships that he has at Brookings. He set it up in place to aim to create people doing work that is really innovative. Other examples, Georgetown as a university. There are others that are now following. If you didn't know Georgetown, the reason how Georgetown became Georgetown, similar to how Princeton became Princeton, because Princeton has now done this, they sold a large group of slaves to create their endowment. That's how a lot of these universities became what they are. They sold 272 people in 1838. Georgetown was about to close. That's how they created their endowment. Students at the university, what they did was they said, we're going to pay a fee of $27.20 every semester. And then interestingly, the university said, no, we're going to come up and we're going to create an endowment so that the descendants of these slaves can end up going to college at Georgetown tuition free. That's an example of atoning for it. The final one I'll mention, well, last two. First is you may or may not have heard of this. Man, if you're like me and you're a bourbon person, you should have because Uncle Nearest is some good bourbon. But if you're looking at that image on the top right, you see uh, Uncle Nearest, all right? Nearest Green, who's right kind of close to Jack Daniels. Nearest actually created Jack Daniels. He made it. Him and Jack Daniels were friends. Of course, this was during the era where people were still slaves. It was a lot of things that were going on. But what happened was Jack Daniels' descendants were going through some of his effects, like an attic or a basement. And they kept seeing Nearest, Uncle Nearest, Nearest. They were like, what the heck is this? And they, and they discovered through Jack Daniels' writings that Nearest is the one who created Jack Daniels' whiskey. What did that family do? Did they try to hide it? No. They came out publicly. They went on search for Nearest's family. And guess where they found several of them? Still working at the Jack Daniels distillery. Now, of course, they're getting paid for it. But that's just fascinating to think that they didn't go anywhere and they were right there. And nobody knew it for decades, for over a century. So what did they do? They said, what does the family want? The family said, we want our families, we want our le the legacy of Uncle Nearest to live on. Jack Daniels said, we're going to fund it all. They gave them funding to create Uncle Nearest Whiskey, the, one of the first kind of Black-owned uh, bourbon and whiskey companies. There are now a couple of others that have popped up. But Jack Daniels then went a step farther and they said, look, every place where Jack Daniels is, if you don't sell Nearest, we won't let you sell Jack Daniels. Well, look, if, if you know like I know, no matter what liquor store you're going to, you're going to see Jack Daniels. So now Uncle Nearest is being broadly distributed. Final example I'll provide, you're looking at this land and you kind of see a house in the distance. That house is where my grandmother lives. My grandfather passed away a few years ago, but my grandmother lives there and my mom now lives there. That land that you're looking at is Indian burial ground land. Out beyond those trees are some Indian hills where there were battles between European colonizers and, um, and American Indians. And this land was the land that my great grandmother's family was on. That land then became land of a prominent family in my hometown. My great grandmother, similar to what a lot of black or Native American women would do, she then became the housekeeper and maid for that family on that land where her family once was. And as she got older, and then as the person who owned the land, the main person passed away, his children 
who were raised where my great grandmother said, you know what, we want to atone for a lot of this. And they gave my great grandmother 13 acres of land. That is the only reason why my grandmother and my grandfather have a house to this day. These are the sort of things that we talk about is that what are we going to do to deal with racism in America? So look, I know I've covered a lot. I look forward to your questions. I want it to be comprehensive. I wanted to give you a lot of information. I know I was moving fast and covered a lot of information, but I look forward to the discussion and I look forward to, depending on how many questions we have, trying to do rapid fire and get through all of them. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. Ray. I do have some questions that are coming in. So um, one is, you know, how can we manage a situation when we have an associate who has issues with other individuals from minority groups? What's the best way to approach that situation? Yeah, I mean, it's so difficult. So th this is my recommendation there. And I get this question a lot. It's a great question because you're in a situation where you know someone doesn't treat people well, but you're like, well, uh, we're, we're like colleagues. We're in the same place. Like, what, what can I do? Well, a few things. First, document. Document everything. It's important. Document so that now there is a record of what's going on and try to include other people in that documentation. So say, for example, if you're like, this person has done some, a couple of racist things, but I'm unsure what's going on. You need to document that as you're trying to decide what you want to do. The next thing you want to do is you want to scale it up. Whoever your supervisor is, whoever is over you, you want to ensure that they are on this email. And sometimes it could be, hey, I saw this incident. This is what I saw. This is what I heard. I'm sending this information to you. Those supervisors, based on what we know about equal opportunity and you know, equal protection laws and discrimination laws, they should be able to do something about that. And I think at that point, there probably needs to be a mediation to try to deal with that. Because this is the thing. Oftentimes, people engage in acts. There are different terms we call them, like microaggressions, for example. Oftentimes, these are things people say and do that they don't even exactly realize is biased or racist or sexist. But it, it doesn't take the sting out. Like, I tell people this. I'm like, people ask me all the time about policing. They say, so, so are you saying that the police who kill all these black people are racist? I'm like, no, I, I didn't say that. If I thought that, I would have said that. Instead, what I'm saying, though, is that it doesn't matter if a person has implicit bias or explicit bias, the outcome is the same, which is that the outcome is discrimination. So at work, what we want to aim to do is to create a discrimination-free zone, a, an equity zone where P, everyone is treated the same. So you want to document you want to scale it up. The way I think about it at companies and corporations, I had um, Dr. James Jackson, who was a famed professor at the University of Michigan, was like a mentor from afar from me. And the times when I would get to meet with him, it would just be profound. This was one of those times. We were talking about how in the academy, these sort of things happen too. And it's a huge hierarchy, right? Like now I'm a full professor. But when I was an assistant professor a decade ago, I mean, the people who I'm working with, they are going to write letters and vote on whether or not I should stay in his job. You don't want to do anything to rock the boat. So what do you do? Well, he talked about identifying people who can use nine lives on you. He said, look, when you're a full professor, you have nine lives. You can take a chance and call people out and nothing happens. So the other thing you want to do at your company, you want to identify who are the people who have status and clout? Who are the people that people listen to? Who are the people who can speak up and speak out for you? And the hit to them in terms of their career is less severe because they, they already have a reputation. It doesn't matter who says it, but you want to have somebody to be able to address it and call it out. Great, thank you. You talked a, a lot about biases. Um, and one of the questions was, I'm, I'm really trying to be a better advocate. Are there any resources um, that you would recommend that our managers could tap into to you know, improve in that area, to identify their biases and to help them overcome that? Yeah, I think so. So um, one of the things that we can do after this, Kathy, I can provide a, a few resources that I think will be helpful for people. Um, it depends on how people are thinking about it. One of the ones that I'm primarily thinking about, it depends on what avenue that we're talking about. A company that I do some consulting with is called Black Onyx Management. They're pretty phenomenal at this with companies. I, you know, Kathy, I mentioned this to you before, but they have like a, um, like an anti-bias hiring program. They have like a what they call a racial equity accomplice program. Like what does it mean to become an accomplice and really 
uh, become anti-racist or anti-sexist? What does that look like? And they do a longer training. It's very innovative. It's very hands-on. Um, it's less people talking at you, which is well, what I did today. And it's really more, more interactive. So yeah, we can definitely talk about those things. I mean, I, you know, I think there are also a series of books that get people scaled up depending on what you want to look at. Um, I could also provide some resources there if, if you like to read or you like to listen to audio books, things that'll just kind of go even more in depth to some of the things that we've talked about today. Great, thanks. Um, all right, another question. Um, you know, how do you respond when people ask you, you've been able to overcome, um, you know, you know, your, your background, you've been successful. Why can't others seem to do the same? Yeah, great question. I love this question. You know, it's uh, cause it makes me go introspective, which is what I don't like to do as a, I, I'm a researcher, right? So I approach things very objectively. I'm like, this isn't about me. This is about other stuff. But I have this conversation often with uh, my best friend from high school. Uh, I was best man at his wedding. He was in my wedding. We played football together. He's a fireman. Family's great. I mean, we're very, very close. He just happens to be white. And we have these conversations all the time. And he's, he's like, great. He, he said, he said, I'm trying to figure this out. He said, I look at you. He said, I look at a couple of our other friends. Like we have another friend who served like three to four tours in Iraq. He now owns his own business. We have another friend who's a radiologist. Um, he, he said, look at you all. You're all successful. He said, so why can't everybody do that? And I said, well, I think about it this way. I'll mention the three people that I mentioned and just highlight a couple of things. The radiologist, um, the story that I told about what happened to Serena Williams and Beyonce when they, when they were giving birth is the same story that happened to my friend who's the radiologist, who's the chief radiologist at one of the top medical schools in the uh, top, top medical programs in the United States and in the world. His wife almost bled out after giving birth because they didn't think she was in pain that she said she was, and they didn't come to her aid. He had to scrub in after his baby was just born to save his wife's life. Those are the kind of outcomes that we talk about. It didn't matter this dude was the chief of radiology at this hospital. To some of the people taking care of his wife, they just saw her as a black woman who didn't deserve the same care. I'll go to myself. Yeah, I've overcame a lot. Look, my, I come from a single parent household. I've never seen my biological father before. Uh, my mom is an amazing person. She chose to get out of the military to raise me. And throughout our lifetime, we moved 14 times by my 18th birthday. And my schools were kind of constant. It's one of the reasons why I liked education. I mean, she tried to put me around role models and other things. But you know where my issue was? One of my issues, despite being the, the you know, the great, great nephew of the first black chief of my hometown, I realized that when I turned 40, that I had been stopped by the police more times than my age. I don't have a criminal record. Um, I have a PhD. Those things really shouldn't even matter in the grand scheme, but I've been thrown up against walls. I've been accosted. I've been arrested by police. And these are the kind of things that completely derail people. I mean, I can tell all kinds of stories about my experiences where I got a speeding ticket going from Memphis to Murfreesboro because I, I, I used to like to drive and I used to like to drive fast. And probably a lot of people did. But what happened from that is the, is the different thing, right? It's one thing to get a speeding ticket. It's another thing to say, oh, well, you need to appear before court. And I appeared before a judge in this county going from Memphis to, well, Murfreesboro is by Nashville in this rural area. And I appeared before a judge who didn't even have a law degree, who told me that, uh, you know, I went, I went in a suit, I was all professional. I was confused on why I was even there for a speeding ticket. They tried to lock me up for a speeding ticket in this county. Could have completely derailed me. It just so happened, I, I knew, I, I said, look, I said, I know that I can request another hearing or a trial. And I called my grandparents and they came. I mean, it, look, I, I could go into to this huge thing about how it happens. My One of my best friends from college, uh, my name, uh, one of my best friends from college happened to be from that town. And she said, oh yeah, who you need to get, Ray, is the lawyer who lives across, who lives a couple houses down from this judge. And the judge's name was Derwood Moore. And she said, he can get you off. He's the, he's the lawyer who helps people like you when they get in trouble in our hometown to get off. Like the, these are the types of things 
that happen that people don't realize how they derail you. Now, again, we're talking about people who are pretty exceptional in, in, in given terms, but the number of hurdles that we have to get over are the things that people have to recognize. Like, like that's a story that I rarely tell because I, I just, oftentimes I don't think it's relevant, but oftentimes when I tell it and I tell people how many times I've been stopped by the police for oftentimes doing nothing. I've been stopped on my cell phone. I've been stopped walking down the street. I've been stopped while studying on campus, while studying off campus. I have police follow me home to my house. I remember being in Bloomington. Police follow me home after I had been studying at the Starbucks I studied at. Uh, the police will follow me. We were on a dark road. These are the things people don't know. Now, I drove an extra mile because I'm going to tell you why. People were probably like, well, the police turned their lights on. You should have stopped. Why would I stop on a dirt road as a black man on this dirt road in Bloomington or where else? So I drove home another mile because Bloomington is not big. I get to my house. I open up my garage door. The police jump out the car with their guns and say, why are you opening up the garage? I'm like, because I live here. I'm letting you know I live here. Why do you have your guns out? I'm glad I didn't be here today. That's just one of the stories that I could tell. And this is the key stat. I mentioned one on policing. Here's another one. One out of every 1,000 black men can expect to be killed by police in their lifetime. One out of every 1,000. And what people don't realize is that oftentimes my life is more similar to the black man who just picked up my trash a couple of hours ago than it is to the white man who's in the office next door to me at University of Maryland or Brookings. That is the thing about America that we don't want to admit. That supposedly, if you do good in school, you never get in trouble. You go to college, you get a good degree. You say, after working at factories that I worked at, that some of the hardest work I've ever done, I have so much respect for people who do manufacturing and, and working class jobs because they are so difficult that I was like, you know what, I'm going to go and get the highest degree possible, whatever that is. I don't even know what that is. None of those things matter when you have certain interactions where people can instantly take your life away. And that's the reason why what happened on Wednesday, people are so upset because you know, like I know that if the demographics of those people who stormed the Capitol look like me instead of what they look like, the outcome would have been different. And until we admit that, until we admit that it doesn't matter if you do everything you're supposed to do, that look, that we reach true equality. People always ask me, like, like when, when will we get there? And I'm like, well, you know, we're making progress. It yings and yangs. We, we got to stay on it. Like, we've made a lot of progress. And we're at a period where, and it's interesting, we're dealing with a health pandemic, too. But one thing that my wife always talks about with being sick, and if you've had the flu or if you've had COVID, you know this as well, that you get really, really sick, then you start to feel better. And you're like, oh, I feel better. And then you get really sick again before you heal up. That's how societies operate. That's how institutions operate. That's how nations operate. And until we're willing to admit that, like we reach true equality when a black woman can be average and still be successful. Because I say a black woman because we're talking about race and gender. Because the people who you all went to, to school with, and you all as well, are oftentimes exceptional people. But I can tell you, teaching a lot of people in college, that um, there are some people who are average, but oftentimes they aren't people who come from marginalized backgrounds. They are exceptional and they have to be exceptional to be there. And we just have to admit those things. Right, thank you. Um, have one more question here. I've got a few more, but I, we'll see what the time looks like. So okay, I'll be quick so we can get through rapid fire. Rapid fire, all right. So what suggestions do you have that we as a company can do to demonstrate that we're looking to improve the lives of our associates of color especially in the departments where we've got a high percentage of, of people of color. Oh yeah, that, this is an easy example. You all are doing it. Exactly what you're doing is what it should be. You all have a plan, you brought in other consultants to help you all with this. I mean, I tell you, I work with a lot of companies on these issues. And um, I mean, based on what I heard from Kathy, you all are light years ahead. And, and it's sad to say light years ahead because really companies should be where you all are. So you're light years ahead of other companies, but you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. I tend to think that companies make the companies and organizations make the most progress when 
they're implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion as just a normative part of what they do. It's not because something's happened or it's not because, you know, we, we're just trying to do something special. You firmly integrate it. And so it seems like you all are doing it. I think in the units where there's a higher percentage of minorities or not, because you want to do it in both areas. Again, you want to do some interviews. You want to do some, some surveys. I tend to think um, a bi-yearly uh, survey can be short. Like, and Kathy, this is something, you know, we could talk about depending on what the consultants provide you all. They might be doing this as well, but it's a short kind of survey that asks people about their interactions. And really what you hope is that normally nothing pops out. Like most people are going to ask you these questions and say, ah, these are silly questions. Everything is fine. That's what you want. But when you start to see a pattern of something happening, you need to address it. And I tend to think that climate surveys is one of the best ways to do that. Great, thanks. Um, one more question and then we're gonna wrap up here. So um, the Justice Department is currently seeking to pare back civil rights protections for minorities by stopping enforcement of protections against discriminatory practices that have a disparate impact on protected groups. So how do you think this will impact future hiring practices? Yeah, so I'll say it in two parts. First, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that they have been doing that. I mean, that they are doing that now. I would say they've been doing it. And they've particularly been doing it strongly over the past four years. So I know in 2020, a lot of things came out publicly around not having bias trainings and you know, removing anti-discrimination policies, that sort of thing. Um, but that's been existing for four years. I do a lot of work with the Department of Homeland Security. I do a lot of work with, um, with other entities in the government. And it's been that way for the past four years. With that being said, the new administration and um, Justice Garland, who is going to be over the Department of Justice, they're going to have a lot of work to do. To um, I, What I expect Biden to do on day one is he's going to have a series of day one executive orders that is going to put back in place these um, equal opportunity protections that we think are extremely important. Because without them, we wouldn't have... I think the, the racial progress that we've had over the past half century or so. So a lot of that has already been going on. It's done a lot of damage, like, like well beyond what people know. Like I used to go in and do bias trainings with the military and with the Department of Homeland Security. Those things have been scratched over the past four years. So that means all the new people who came in have not went through these trainings on how to be equitable. Um, I think they're going to institute a lot of that and it'll take a little while to get back on course, but you know, I, I think that it will happen uh, quicker than people think. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Ray, I really wanna thank you for such an energetic and informative discussion. I can speak for myself, but I'm sure for everyone else who is attending today that I've certainly learned a great deal from you. Um, it was highly impactful. As we talked about earlier, it's aligned very much with our strategy of diversity, equity, inclusion, but I think more importantly, it really is aligned with our core values, our values.